Okay, John. You know, when we talked about this concert in the, this strange world of lockdown, and we made, we sort of decided um, and discussed first what program we want to do. We sort of talked about that we want to choose composers that have a particular role in OSJ. Absolutely. Life and and in your in your life as yeah. well, and yep. and Schubert and Forey are the ones. Well, we came we, up with them. Maybe we've done both of those as much as any composers over the fifty years. Yeah, which which works of Schubert sort of played a particular role well, for you? All uh, we, we had a wonderful project about thirty years ago. We did all the symphonies in five concerts five times. We did twenty five concerts. With wonderful soloists, Janet Baker and Murray Pariah and Marisa Robles, various people. That was wonderful to work our way right through because some of the early ones are never done. Yeah. Um, Everybody does three and five and eight and nine and all that. But we did the whole lot five times. That was wonderful to really get into because they're all marvelous. But of course, the very, very famous ones slightly put the others in the shadow, but they're yeah. but worth an outing. But actually, I think we both have um, a special affinity to the unfinished. Yeah, that's right. That's you right. Tell us, tell so, us I mean, your, your I mean, I can, unfinished story. Uh, well, my unfinished story is, is, is that, that I was a little boy and I went on my first summer camp. And it was conducted by a mesmerizing musician, a man from South Tyrol who, who wore the customary beard that goes coming from that part of the world. And, and he'd started the violin quite late in life, so he wasn't a brilliant violinist, but he was a musician through and through. And he used a big brush the way you need to when you speak to these young hearts who are ready to experience something they don't know about. And we did the Schubert Unfinished Symphony. And I remember sitting in this in an old medieval cloisters in in southern Germany somewhere and and we were started rehearsing and I started to have this extraordinary feeling and of this yearning and the music and sharing this with all my friends and and the things in that piece that I had no experience. It was telling talking about things that I had not experienced. But you awaken in the way that you awaken when you have great stories being told to you at that age. And I remember there and then deciding that's it, that's the way to go. I mean, that, I, I wanted that feeling of a collective sharing of this extraordinary sounds and the, the story it was telling. I wanted that to do as much as possible in my life. And that was really the, the sort of starting point where I then decided that's, that seems like a reasonable thing. To endeavor. What was it for you then? Well, it was a similar sort of starting point, but much later in life. Because the first group I started was a string quartet, oboe, harpsichord, me as a baritone, Norma Barrows as a soprano, and we did lots of concerts. And then I thought we'd better commission a work. So we commissioned a work from Paul Patterson called The Nails of Death. And it was for tenor and 13 instruments. And it needed conducting. So I conducted it. That was the first time I'd ever conducted anything. Okay. So then I thought, I better check out this conducting business. <laughs> so I auditioned at the academy for the conducting class. And so the first piece I conducted with an orchestra was the Schubert Unfinished. And I remember I was terribly, terribly nervous. I mean, I had stomach cramps with nerves. And I remember talking to Helen Powell, who was the oboist in my mm -hmm. small chamber group. I remember just before I went on, I said to her, this is in three. Does the second beat go right or left? <laughs> So this is pretty basic stuff. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I managed to go dee dee, managed to get that. But that piece, I mean, it is an absolutely exquisite piece. But yeah. it's special in my life because that was the first orchestra I ever conducted. Yeah. So I and think how did that feel? D d how um, did that feel conducting that and having that sound come back oh, at you? I mean, it's a blur now, actually. Yeah. But I think it was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think I may not have been a conductor unless I'd had an orchestra. But having started this group and then it, it grew into a chamber orchestra and the chamber choir. And uh, here we are, 53 years later. Well, it's also a very special relationship when you have your own orchestra. Yes. Because you have musicians that you know and that understand you and in a way you start to speak almost like a dialect. Each composer has its own dialect, so you, you need very little gestures. Yeah, it's, it's very different to, to going in front of another orchestra where, yes. where you have to explain or, or, or find a different way of showing yeah. everything yeah. With, your, with the musicians that have accompanied you for so many years. Oh, they have to do anything. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful that. I mean, I think 
deep in my heart, I'm probably an amateur. I mean, I hope the musicians think I prepare. That means a like love a of professional music. Amateur. Exa- and a love of the people. You yeah. know, I, I hope they think I prepare professionally and rehearse professionally and yeah. perform professionally. But deep in my heart, what is so wonderful about having this group is that I just, I only do music that I love and I work with musicians that I love. Yeah. And that's, I can't beat that. No, actually, I'm, I'm very, feel very lucky to be part of it. Well, me too.